Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> um, can we all just pray really quickly? Everybody want to pray with me, please? Let's just close our eyes, bow our heads. Uh, our Heavenly Father, I just want to come before you today, and I want to thank you for everybody here. And I want to thank you for bringing us all together, so many people here. And I'm just, I'm just so happy to be here where I am and to be with the people that I'm with. And I thank you for them, Father. Thank you for keeping us all safe and bringing us together here today. Uh, Father, I ask that you bring your Holy Spirit here and touch every heart that's in this room right now and bring them all closer to Jesus Christ. In his name I pray. Amen. All right. So the last time I was up here, I was sharing my testimony about when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was probably one of the happiest times of my life because for the first time in my life, I felt a love that I had never felt before. It was a perfect love, and it was everything I had ever been looking for. And for that next like week, maybe 10 days, um, I was so excited. And I was even just, when I was by myself, I was singing, you know, uh, one of the songs that we sing here, I'll Give You More. Everybody know that song? I don't need to sing it then. I was singing, I'll give you more, oh, I'll give you more, cause you deserve all this and more, so I'll give you more. And I was just so on fire for God, and I was so excited, and I was ready to take on the world. I was ready to do anything that he asked me to. And then pastor came and told us all, let's stop doing things we like. And I was like, oh. <laughs> he's, he's probably not talking about me. He's, uh, you know, I, I just got to this new level, and he's talking about going to the next level by fasting for 68 days and by abstaining from the pleasures of our flesh and the things that entertain us. So, you know, at first I was like, okay, you know what, I love everybody in this church. I'll, I'll do the eight hours a day, no food, no drink, and, you know, I'll just, I'll just support everybody. You know, I'm, I'm a background player, and that, that's okay. But, you know, that night when I was praying, you know, the Lord really came to me, and he said to me, he said, hey, wasn't there somebody singing he was going to give me more? So I said, um, yeah, that, that, that might have been me. And he said, I want you to give up a lot for me, but there's a lot that I'm going to give back to you and a lot to your church and the people that you love. So he asked me to stop eating meat, and I was like, seriously? And he said, I deserve what? You'd... Lord, you deserve more. And then he asked me to stop watching sports, and I said, wow, come on, seriously? And he said, you're going to give me what? And I said, more, more. So these last 68 days of this fast were the longest 68 days of my life. How ironically named that a fast would seem like it took forever. And, you know, in about the third day of the fast, I had a complete meltdown with Vic you know, in his car, and I was sitting there, and I was like, I can't do this. I'm going to let everyone down. God's going to be so angry with me. I can't. I can't do this. I made a mistake, and Vic was just like, hey, relax. And, you know, Vic, he only got a scene. Later that night when I was in prayer, God got the whole Broadway musical, and I, I just melted down, and I, I told him everything that I was afraid of and everything that I doubted in myself, and he just said, hey, just just walk that walk, man. And I was like, walk that walk? Don't you mean walk the walk? He's like, no, 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 walk that walk. And I didn't really understand at first. And then a couple days later, I was reading. And if everybody could turn with their Bibles to me to Isaiah, uh, chapter 30, verse 20. And it reads, And though the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, Yet your teachers will not be moved into a corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, This is the way, walk in it. Wherever, whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left, you will also defile the covering of your images of silver and the ornament of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing. You will say to them, Get away from me. 
So I thought, oh, is, is that the walk you're talking about? And he said, no, that's not the walk. I was like, oh, okay. But as I meditated and I thought about it, when you look at this verse, it's really beautiful because the first line it says, it's talking about the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Now, a lot of us would think, it's like, oh, well, why would God give us uh, suffering and affliction? But you have to look at it again. He's also giving us bread and water, the very most essential things to sustain our bodies. Yeah, this is tough love at its finest right here. You know, the Lord cares for the birds in the sky. How much more will he care for you? This is how much more he cares for us. He gives us tough love. He gives us personal attention. He's there for us. No matter what, he will do whatever it takes to make us better. And then it says, your eyes will see your teachers. The teachers are Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. They're the ones who guide you. They're the ones who show you how to do things. They're the ones who draw you closer to themselves. I mean, we have all been to high school. Everybody has been in math, right? You know, if you pay attention for maybe five minutes, you have no idea what else is going on. We need to focus on Jesus Christ like that. That's how it's got to be done because... The second that we lose focus, that's when we fall, and that's when we turn away from the Lord, and that's when our lives really fall apart. And he tells you to walk to the left or walk to the right, and that's really what it is when you walk with Jesus. You're walking with him, and he says, hey, there's some temptation coming up. Let's veer to the right a little bit. You know, there's, there's going to be some problems coming up. Let's turn to the left. And that's, that's how you walk with Jesus. And I was like, oh, is that the walk? No, that's not the walk. <laughs> and then he says here, after that, you will defile your coverings of images of silver and your ornaments of gold. These are the idols. These are the things that distract us from spending time with God. And these are the things that pull us away from him and draw us to sin and the things that just really aren't for us. And that's one of the things that I learned during this fast was when we give our full attention to the Lord, that's when we grow closer to him. That's when we fall even more in love with him. You know, uh, a couple weeks back, I was wearing this new sweater that my friend had given me for my birthday. It was very nice. It was like a $100 sweater, Japanese fibers, just beautiful. So I was telling Pastor Ali here about it, and what does he do? He starts pinching me and tugging at my sweater. And of course, I was like, no, please don't, it's Japanese. <laughs> That's how we need to protect our spirits from the things that attempt us to draw away from the Lord because the devil will always be coming at you, tugging. It's like, hey, what are you doing? What's, what's this? No, 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 no. You, you look to Jesus. You look to him, and you keep focus. But of course, we're only human, right? And we all, we all take our eyes off Jesus from time to time. It's just it's, it's who we are, and that's why we need God. And then I read to Matthew verse 14, I'm oh, sorry, chapter 14, verse 24. Everybody there? But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt me? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you were the Son of God. Now, in this verse, they talk about the fourth watch. And if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I believe that somewhere around three to four in the morning, so, you know, they're all probably tired, they're weary, they've been rowing on some sea whose name I probably can't pronounce. And they see, they see a figure, and, you know, 
course they're afraid because as humans, we're just naturally afraid of the things that we don't know and the things that we don't understand. And Jesus immediately, key word, immediately says to them, don't worry, it's, it's just me, guys. So then Peter, who is the, the bold one of the group, he's the one who thinks without, uh, he acts without thinking. And really quickly, Pastor, I need to correct you. A couple weeks ago, you said Vic acts without thinking, but that's not true. Vic obeys faithfully without questions. I act without thinking. Yeah. Remember, remember that time at Costco? Yeah. If, if anybody wants to know the story, ask Vic. He loves telling it. <laughs> oh, that lady was so mad. <laughs> but, uh... So Peter challenges Jesus, saying, if it really is you, you know, let's prove it. Let, let me walk on the water to you. And I thought to myself, I'm like, I would probably do what Peter did, because I would probably be standing there thinking, I want to walk on water. But no, the truth is, the reason why Peter or any of us would do that is because they want God so badly, and they want to see him, and they want to find the truth that they are voluntarily risking their lives to step into an ocean in the middle of a storm just to find Jesus. So he walks out and he takes a couple steps and then he, he, he looks away. He gets distracted and he falls in and he screams out, Lord, save me. He screams out, Lord. He doesn't scream out anything or anyone else. He says, Lord, as in Jesus. He didn't say, you know, church, save me. He didn't say, one of the guys that helps in the boat, throw me a rope. He said, Jesus, save me. Because it's Jesus alone that saves, Jesus alone that redeems, and Jesus alone that gives us the love that we could never deserve. So then, Jesus, in his infinite mercy, walks over and he takes him by the hand and he says, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt me? And again, as human beings, we just automatically assume that, you know, Jesus is condemning him and trying to make him feel bad. But that's not true because, you know, that's not, that's not the Jesus that I know. The Jesus that I know doesn't play the guilt game. The Jesus that I know plays the conviction game and the grace game. And when he's holding him by the hand saying, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt me? You know that my grace is sufficient for you. You know that, you know that through me you can do all things. You know that in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Peter, before I, you were formed in the womb, I knew you. And I know the plans that I have for you, and that is to prosper you and not harm you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that who believeth in him may not perish and have everlasting life. And the very next verse, it goes on to say, for he did not come to condemn, he came to save. Come on, Peter, get out of the water. And then, you know, you, you start thinking, it's like, oh, ye of little faith. And there is, there is a certain uh, verse that comes to mind when you think of the word faith. That's even with the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. And I don't know if anybody else has ever done this, like, you know, looked out to an actual mountain and thought to themselves, I have faith. All right, mountain. Just a little to the left. <laughs> and you're like, oh. No, anybody else do that? Yeah, 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 me neither. <laughs> so, uh, but that's the thing. With the faith of a mustard seed, you can move mountains? No, no, Jesus can move mountains for you. And in this scenario, this is when you realize no actual physical mountain is worth moving. The only thing worth needing to move is Jesus himself because he's the one that's going to pull you out of the water. And uh, so Peter gets out of the water and he's walking back to the boat with Jesus. All the while, all the 11 of the other disciples are watching this like, Oh my goodness, what did, what did we just see? Our friend walked on water, he fell, and Jesus pulls him out. Truly, this is the Son of God. You know, a lot of people want to focus on the miracle of Jesus and Peter walking on the water, but I don't believe that that was the real miracle here. 
The real miracle is when 12 guys finally have their brains and their hearts agree. We all have conflicts within ourselves. We all have internal debates, like in our head and then in our heart. Like, hey, that, that girl is terrible for you. You should not be with her. And then the heart goes, but we love her. You know, or you think to yourself, it's like, you know, this would probably be the responsible thing to do. But then the heart says, no, come on, let's go out and have fun. But here, in this scenario, the, the head says, this is the son of God. And the heart says, yeah, this is the son of God. That's the real miracle, everybody, is when the 12 disciples changed their hearts and they finally believed that Jesus was who they thought he was. And the wicked, evil heart of man finally, finally gets what it's been looking for since the fall. You know, God's back, and he's here with us, and he's come to save us. So they walk back into the boat, and they get inside, and they, they're worshiping him. They're so excited. And you're, you're the son of God. Oh, my goodness. Yes, yes, yes. It's finally here. He's finally here. We were talking last week about worship, and you guys want to talk about worshiping? This is how you worship. You worship Jesus Christ like Peter did, in wet clothes, on a boat, in the middle of nowhere, during a storm, at four in the morning. We will always have excuses to not pray, to not be thankful, or any of these things, but God will always be there. And to tell the truth, for the last, like, two weeks, I have not known how this sermon was going to end, and I had no idea where I was going to lead to. I had pretty much everything up in here ready and prepared, and I was, you know, it was fine. And it wasn't until last night when I was in prayer, and I told the Lord, I'm like, Lord, please, just, just, just be with me tomorrow, okay? And that's when he said to me, he's like, I've always been here. I've always been here with you, and I've been always walking with you. How else do you think you did anything good? He's like, that's that walk, man. When you walk with me, and you were in love with me, and you listen to me, that's when great things happen. That's when miracles happen. And, you know, it, that, that's when you really get to know Jesus, is when you walk with him. And that's what we learn in this fast. And that's when, when the idols are away and the distractions are away and you've got nothing but you and Jesus. That's, that's when it gets really, really real. And, you know, the next part of this is that it really hurt me to think that there were people out there in the world who don't know Jesus the way that we know Jesus. They don't know the Jesus that rescued Allie. They don't know the Jesus that comforts Cheryl or the Jesus that inspires Vic or the Jesus that loves me and everybody else unconditionally so much that he died for us. You know, that's what we got to do, church. We got to be like Peter. We got to seek out the Lord. We got to get off the boat. And you know what? Maybe we even have to fall into the water a little bit just so Jesus can help us out. But the important thing is that everybody else back on the boat sees it. We can't hide it. We can't just, we, we can't just let something great happen to us and say, yeah, no, you know, no big deal. It's like, no, 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 Jesus, help me. I wouldn't have done it without him. You know, that, that's the way we have to walk. We have to walk in faith. We have to walk with him. We have to walk in his love. And... We just, we just have to obey. In John, Jesus Christ says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And it's really easy to think that, you know, the commandments that he's referring to are maybe the Ten Commandments or maybe John fifteen twelve. you know, my commandment to you is this, that you love one another as I have loved you. But that is not the case. The case is this, is that when you are walking with Jesus Christ every day, pretty much every hour, there is a new commandment that he is giving to you. And we have to do these things because that's how the kingdom grows. That's how souls are saved. That's how we grow. 
You know, when you walk with Jesus Christ, he tells you sometimes, you know, in your heart, you say, hey, why don't you call your friend? He's down. He could use some support. Or he tells you, he's like, come on, let's just go pray, or let's go read the world, let's spend some time together, or let's say, hey, there's that homeless guy. Go, go buy him something to eat. That's how we got to walk, church. That's that walk.